Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here. I love being within these walls and with all of you. It's always a very special time for me to come back here. Um, I started here, as Chris, Kristen said, I graduated in 95 from the Cabinet and Furniture Program. So I started over 30 years ago, and it was, of course, in the other building. Um, and a lot has changed. Um, but I even, in this to me, these halls of this building are hallowed as well. I still feel that energy of this place that's really hard to describe to other people who have never experienced it. Um, and one of the things, before I introduce myself more and tell you more about me, I thought it was interesting that Kristen referred to this as furniture. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I mean, that is one of the things that gets um, blurry in my world and in what I do and part of what I'm going to talk to you all about. Some of you have heard part of this not that long ago. Um, so I'm trying to talk um, in this presentation a little bit more about how I got from furniture or the kinds of things that I learned to build here and the way that I learned to build here to this lipstick red you know, painted plywood piece that is this furniture or not? I would probably say no if I was pressed. Um, but so the work that I make now um, does not reside within the functional furniture world. I am an artist. Um, I make sculptural work. Um, it's pretty conceptual work. And unlike a lot of people who do woodworking or furniture like objects in the art world and art furniture who still make functional work. My, my work for the most part is purely sculptural and does not function. It references, but it references function. Okay. So yes, I'm Bea Harrington. Um, after graduating from, oops, sorry. No, stand more here. After, you after graduating from North Bennett, someone was just asking me, what did I do? Um, so I stuck around the Boston area um, for a while, took up shop space, ASAP, started building custom furniture for people. Um, not full time. I always had some kind of waitressing or bartending or something to supplement that. I came here, though, with an art background. My undergrad was in studio art. I was working mostly in textiles. Um, I knew that I wanted to work with my hands, and I thought I also did art education. So I was, before I came to North Bennett, I was teaching elementary kids art. And I, I knew that whatever I, whatever medium I ended up working in, I would eventually take that to the art world, back to the art world. And um, I didn't have much woodworking experience, but I grew up in a family of carpenters. All the men in my family were carpenters. My grandfather, my father, I have three older brothers. I'm the only daughter. My brothers were all taught carpentry skills as they were growing up. It didn't occur to anyone to have my father teach me those skills, right? But I had been around building, construction, wood. Um, and one of the things um, that I talked about a, a lot in the, in the making series um, that I had the privilege, the great privilege of having a conversation with Mary Savick, who is the uh, curator of craft at the Smithsonian. So my In the Making um, episode was a conversation with her about my work, which was a really special thing and very honored for me to be able to do that. And it was the folks at North Bennett who made that possible. I was remembering early conversations with Sarah and Kevin um, about before the In the Making series even started um, before COVID, right? Um, so one of the things that came out of that conversation, I realized that for me, growing up, the family that I was in, making was never a question. You always made things. We all made things. Um, and my, my father was a builder, you know, construction, but my mother also was always making food, always making clothes. Um, so that uh, conversation that I got to have also helped me understand more the role that my mother's work and the feminine side of things played because I'm so strongly as a woodworker, I'm so strongly identified um, with my father and the men in my family and woodworking as a traditional, traditionally male trade. 
So actually that brings up then what I will say. So I, I built custom furniture um, for about 10 years and then eventually uh, returned to academia and studio art and did a master of fine arts in wood um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with Tom Loser. Um, and then eventually got my first full-time teaching job in academia. And so I have just um, started my 12th year teaching woodworking um, in the art department of a university um, in Western Pennsylvania called Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And I teach <coughs> mostly, I teach students to make mostly functional work like I learned here, but nothing, it's not an art, it's not, it's not North Penn, right? it's, not, it's an art department in ac academia. So it, it, I'm not able to teach the level of craft that we learned here, but I knew that no matter what I did with my hands, that craft would be very important. And so when I started, um, I had an epiphany and started thinking about woodworking, I knew that, um, I was already living in Boston. And so once I found out about North Bennett and what it was, I knew that this was the place that I needed to be and that I needed to learn my skills, even though I knew eventually I was gonna turn them back to the art world and probably not continue making period furniture. What I didn't know though, was that my artwork was gonna end up still so closely being tied to the period furniture that I sort of grew up on at North Bennett. So I like to show these three chairs because they um, sort of helped me make sense of the trajectory that my practice took um, and also have were part of an epiphany that sort of led me to woodworking. So as I said, I, 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 I was familiar with making. I had been around construction. I knew the smell of wood, right? Um, I, I had suddenly heard about North Bennett Street. Um, and started looking into woodworking that was part of the art world. And there was a um, really pivotal exhibition at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts called New, Amer New, Amer New American Furniture. New American Furniture. There was all these studio furniture makers, people making art furniture. Um, and they had been invited to look at, piece, look at um, historical furniture in the museum's collection and make a contemporary art piece in response to that. Okay. So I went to see that show, it was in 1989, and um, of all the amazing things, I mean, it was, I was, my mind was blown when I saw the work and like, whoa, what you can make. I had been around a lot of antique furniture and stuff, but seeing these art pieces, like my mind was blown with what people were making in wood. But one chair in particular really struck me and it was this, Rocking Chaise by Michael Hurwitz. Okay, and it's beautifully crafted, um, elegant, um, and very contemporary looking at the same time that it it, it just had this feel to it, this, this time honored feel as well. Um, so then I found out about North Bennett Street School and I went to a student show, student exhibition that was actually at the State House. And again, I was, I, so this was not art furniture, right? This was period furniture, reproduction period furniture that I was seeing. And there was this piece, this chair, again, this chair that just struck me more than anything else I saw there. And I just fell in love with it. And it was beautiful. And um, it was made by a student, Tony Hayden, who I later got to um, be a student with and have bench space right next to him and watch him build amazing, amazing things. Um, but again, I, I was struck by how elegant the chair was, how contemporary it sort of looked, but that it was this reproduction of this timely piece. And then when I went back and, and revisited the, the art show and looked, I realized that the Michael chair, the Michael Hurwitz chair that I was so taken with, the historical piece that it was inspired by and responded to was the same historical Samuel Gregg chair that Tony Hayden's piece was an exact or near exact reproduction of. And for me, that was this epiphany moment where I was like, all right, that's it. I'm gonna be a woodworker and I'm going to North Bennett Street School. Um, but now I sort of look at these three chairs as 
um, kind of explaining my own trajectory with woodworking from the very traditional training at North Bennett Street School to then taking that um, to the art world and practicing training as a studio artist. Um, but then the historical piece, the Samuel Gregg piece, once I got to graduate school um, and part of graduate school and an MFA program, you're building things, you're building art, but we also had to take art history classes. And so one of the classes I took was early American decorative arts that made a lot of sense. And I was suddenly studying these furniture forms that I had studied at North Bennett in order to learn how to build them. But now I'm studying the historical context and learning about the history of these forms and the role that they played in people's lives, you know, the makers, the users, the time period they were built in and what was going on in the country during the time period. Why, you know, Queen Anne follows Will William Mary, why uh, Rococo follows Queen Anne, then the drastic shift to the federal period and how, why things change drastically the way they look. And that then, <laughs> Suddenly these furniture forms came alive to me in a very different way, a sort of material culture way. Um, and that became the sort of conceptual foundation or fodder for my studio practice. And I began building furniture forms, sculptural forms that referenced um, iconic early American furniture forms. And what I was drawn to was forms that were specifically built to be used by women. And we'll look at some of those in a minute. I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the early stuff, you know, that I made. So um, this is the chair that I made as a student here that was based on a chair in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, you know, like Tony had done a reproduction of a Samuel Gregg chair. So I got to go with my instructors and um, look at the piece, measure the piece. And even here though, you can see the little art person in me. <laughs> could not do an exact reproduction. And I had to tweak it a little bit and you know, insert my own um, voice in there a little bit. So I changed the intersecting ovals um, on the Seymour piece to these Gothic arches instead and changed it to cherry and madrone and ebony. Um, but again, true, you know, very true structurally anyways, reproduction. Then after I graduated, um, I had the privilege of building several pieces for the same client who had just re-renovated his house in the craftsman style and wanted all this art, artists and craftsmen furniture, um, some of it straight reproduction. So this was just a straight reproduction of a Limbert um, settle, but I had to you know, figure out, I had to measure it, uh, scale it from a, a photograph, things I learned to do here as a student, figure out how to make it. And then here I was starting to add my own voice and originality a little bit in um, by adding marquetry and inlay to it. So that was the way that I was finding um, to be more artistic in what I was doing, more creative um, as far as my own ideas. And then this was a, this client had gone out to um, California and seen the Gamble House by the Green and Green Brothers. So then suddenly he was all excited about what the Green and Green Brothers did and came back and said, I want a green and green style piece, but you've got to make it to match my Mission Oak stuff because they usually, the, most of their stuff was mahogany, you know, that was California arts and crafts. So I did this hybrid saddle and this was the first time I got to sort of design my own thing, but very much based in a specific style. And then I also did some commissions like this, very contemporary piece um, where the piece was designed by architects for their clients. And this was a little bit more challenging because now I had to figure out, you know, there wasn't some historical precedent <laughs> for how you did this. So it was really putting some of the things that I learned here to the test and, okay, you learn this. Now you should be able to figure out how to make pretty much anything once you've learned the foundations or the basics um, of fine woodworking the way we do here. So it was a, a sideboard, um, a lot of veneer work, sideboard and dining table. Okay. So just to give you a brief um, background of what I was doing for the first 10 years after I left North Bennett, then I went to art school. <laughs> and then this, <laughs> stuff like this came out, right? Um, 
and I'll, I'll I'll talk a little bit um, more about my practice and how it how I think about historical furniture, and where my ideas come from. But I do want to say that, um, so th this piece was made not that long ago, 2020, but it was based on an early series that I did. So I re revived that form and did something different with it. But this was one of the scariest things that I did as a maker was to brad nail plywood together <laughs> and paint it red and call it art, right? And part of, part of the scariness came from what, from being here and what I learned to do here, right? When I started working this way, it felt like blasphemy, right? And also I wasn't very good at it yet. You don't learn how to use the nail gun here. At least I didn't, <laughs> right? So I didn't, I hadn't used a nail gun before, right? So I was shooting the head all the wrong way, right? It was like, there was this crazy learning curve and I was having a crisis in graduate school over who I was and what, at the same time I knew when I went to art school, right, the, the badass skills that I got here weren't gonna carry me there, right? I couldn't continue doing period reproduction furniture, or even these custom arts and crafts kind of stuff. You know, this was about art and ideas and concept. Um, so I did have, the, did have this crisis. And the way that this came about, so I got to backtrack a little bit. Oh, wrong computer again, sorry. <laughs> I got to backtrack a little bit. And so, so while I'm taking that art history class and looking back at these furniture forms that I was fairly fairly familiar with from being a student here. So while I was a student here, one of, one of the guys made his tool chest as a little miniature sort of reproduction of a Hadley chest or not actually the Hadley chest, the Thomas Dennis, but close enough. And so I, and I had learned about the Had Hadley chest and these, this quirky cover, carving that covers the fronts now it's one of one of was one of the earliest sort of American styles. But when I was taking, when I was studying it as an art history student, then I started learning more about what these chests were, that they were built as dowry chests for young women. And that a lot of them have these initials carved on the front, but we don't necessarily know who those initials belong to because probate records were all controlled by men and property was owned by men. So these were put, so we might not know who MM was, who this chest was originally made for. We might guess who MM was by looking at the records. Anyway, a lot of really fascinating things about these forms. So I just became enthralled with this. And one of the first pieces that I made then was a version of a Hadley chest. And actually now my the largest body of work I have is all based on this Hadley chest form. So I studied the form um, and I got to go study a Hadley chest form um, that was owned by the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee. So I got to go do hands-on study with it the way I got to here at the Museum of Fine Arts, look at it, figure out how to build it. So what I did here as an artist, I kept that form of the chest, right? The chest form was what I kept fixed the way that it was built, the legs, the styles as the vertical pieces, the horizontal rails, the three panels of the Hadley chest form, very iconic, three panels across the front, one drawer below, a couple of them, two drawers below, right? But I kept that and then I started playing around with other things related to that. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm thinking of these dowry chest, what does that mean? What was a dowry? We don't have dowries in this country anymore. There are still some countries that practice very um, controversially and a lot of anguish. Anyway, that's other research that you can do around dowry. So thinking about what, you know, what that meant and also do, I start doing a lot of historical research then reading about this time period, reading about women's history and dowries and thinking about my own history and my own relationship to woodworking coming down through the men in my family and 
me being a woman, but doing this male identified trade. And, um, and when I was a student here, there were, there were never more than six women in the cabinet and furniture program at a time. And there were no women instructors. I think Paul was Paula or were you the first Paula, Paula and then Claire, but uh, it was, it was a very different, a different place. Um, amazing. But Anyway, just thinking about all that stuff, thinking about inheritance, vocation, um, and my own family history, and and then playing around with the form. And the first thing that I did, one of the first things that I did was pull those panels out and the drawers out, and then started thinking about the interior of the chest and what, what would have been stored in the interior of those chests would have been the items that a woman was collecting for her dowry, a lot of them like textile things. Right. And when you go see these chests and museums, you may or may not get information that tells you what they were. And here they are 300 years later, standing in museums empty. You know, and then I'm thinking the, of, about the an anonymity of women's lives and that women's handiwork was also consumed by the household or consumed by the elements and disappears like textiles that women worked with don't stand up to the elements the way that would. Uh, so all of those kinds of things I'm thinking about. And then just doing different things sculpturally with those forms in back in museum storerooms, you see furniture stacked up. Initially this move was because my studio space was becoming full of these chests and they're fairly large. And so I started stacking them on each other. And then I was like, oh, well that, you know, what does it, that is kind of cool. What does that do? And eventually I started, it started taking on this almost totemic quality to stack them like that. And I started thinking about generations stacked on each other and learning and, or even the idea of as a woman, you know, the idea of sort of crawling up out of the oppression of a patriarchy or that kind of thing. Um, I've, I've had the great honor and privilege to be able to show my work in some pretty spectacular places. Um, so this was um, an installation. It was part of a three person exhibition at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And this was cool because right around the corner from where my pieces were was one of the original Hadley chests on display the one that I had um, studied and actually, um, so one of the, th you'll see two different things that I did. Um, this one in the foreground here. So I, this was a finer piece, you know, it was actually built out of quarter sawn oak, mortise and tenons, you know, and um, I still left the panels out. And then I had the idea to fill the interior with folded stacked antique linens to sort of speak to, that history of what would have been stored. And then plus it looks cool to be able to look <laughs> through the panels and see these lacy edges. Um, the one in the background is three plywood versions of the chest stacked, painted white with milk paint, cotton boil, again, thinking of the, that textile history of what they would have stored, right? Cotton boil hanging behind the openings. And then I had, um, what you see, the sort of silhouette that you see there is a video that I had a friend of mine that I collaborate with sometimes who's a video and sound artist make. Um, it was my hands stitching. Um, and it's a video projected onto the front of those and my hands stitching um, the motifs here that I ended up embroidering. So this is another piece where I literally, I left the panels, you know, I left the chest open. It's it's still a chest built with mortise and tenon and everything. So, and you can see through um, the silk panels there that I stitched so that you could see into the inside. And if you look closely enough, you still, you can see the fantastic quarter sawn grain that's dyed red. But I also, so I was the hands that built um, the wood object, 
My hands were also the hands that stitched and here my textile background from my early days as an art student in undergrad nicely came in through the back door, which was um, really exciting for me. But what I stitched on the front here was the original lines that are carved on the Hadley chest that the Chipstone Foundation owns. So they actually let me do a rubbing um, of the chest. And then I was able to pull those carved lines off, translate them into a line that could be stitched because it's not exact because stitching is a very different act from the sort of um, sort of violent carving into the wood. Although stitching, you often prick yourself and bleed. But anyway, this, this also was a really important piece for me as an artist um, because I didn't have a lot of time to get this work ready for um, the exhibition. And I had just finished my MFA, my three-year MFA. And because I was doing so much historical research for my artwork, I decided to stay on and add a master's degree in art history. So I was just starting um, as a, a master's student in art history, and they asked me to be part of this exhibition. So my um, wood professor, who I had done my MFA with, said, "Bia, you can't, you can't do all of it. You, you got to let something go here." And he kept trying to tell me, even during the MFA, you need to build more work. So farm out some, you know, get someone to help you do this. Or and I'm like, no, I have to do it all. Well, he was like, get hire a seamstress to sew that thing and do the embroidery. And I, I knew I couldn't do that. First of all, I didn't want to relinquish that control. Um, and also I wanted to do, I wanted to do all of it. I want, but I didn't understand until after I made this piece that what I also needed to do was experience the tension between a hard, rigid, material like wood that takes a lot of planning and calculation before you commit, the tension between that and a very flexible, pliable material like fabric, and you know how much room I needed to allow. Anyway, there was a lot of back and forth for me. And also um, when I first stitched the front panel of this before I started embroidering, I again, I freaked out because the seams weren't straight, <laughs> right? Because when you cut wood, it's straight, right? As long as everything's set up right. Well, seams, I, so I was like, oh my God, these seams are, big. and I took it to the um, women at the little sewing shop that I bought a lot of my supplies where they had also helped me tune up my uh, great aunt's 1950s featherweight singer that I sewed it on. And they're like, oh my gosh, those are perfect. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, but that that back and forth tension helped me also realize the the, the gender tensions <clears throat> that were sort of inherent in this object, both historically, but also what it says in our contemporary world, and also the ge the gender tensions that were within me personally. Um, so that was. That was really exciting. That, and then I'm just going to quickly go through some other, um, show you some other exhibitions and installations. The piece in the background here, then, um, is I know I gotta I gotta speed things up here. But the piece in the background uh, was a collaboration between my father and I. Mm -hmm. It's still based on that Hadley chest form you can see, but it's three times the scale, so it's three times larger. Um, and the proportions are as close to the original proportions as we could get while using framing lumber, right? So we we were we had to shift things a little bit because framing lumber is fixed, right? And, and I wanted us to build it the way you would frame a house. So this was now my father and I in di dialogue with each other, our different skill sets in dialogue with each other, swinging hammers together building this piece. And I wouldn't have known how to build this without him because I didn't learn the carpentry. I can, you know, I can do some stuff, but again, and he could, you know, so it was this really nice um, back and forth in lots of ways um, for us. And then things like, um, you know, you can see earlier on, I put some of them on rockers because when I started taking the panels out, the form started reminding me of different things. It kind of looked like a cage. It kind of looked like 
a house, but it also looked kind of like a cradle. Um, so I, I put one on uh, rockers, which is, um, well, and I'll just, so I, I don't talk about this often, but um, I am not a mother. Um, and for me, that piece, putting it on rockers has a little bit, I didn't realize this right away. It took me a while to understand this about my own work, but it does have a little bit to do with my own. Again, those tensions within ourselves, right, that come out in work like this, you know, my own sort of ambivalent, ambivalent feelings about motherhood or not, the choices I make, the choices I didn't make, you know, that kind of that kind of thing is all um, in here as well. And you can imagine this one that is the little rocker on the rocking plinth is very, it's very, um, it actually, someone rocked it in an exhibition and the, the baby rocker fell off and broke and had to move it there. But it's really weird to be around. Um, and again, that tension, um, it's also beautiful, the, the smooth, Right, you know, and I learned to do that here to figure out how to make a smooth motion with rockers. So, and then I'm just going to talk briefly about a couple of the other forms that I I focus on. Then um, a lady's work table. Some of you may be familiar with these. I don't know if anyone's made, it, but with these amazing fabric um, sack-like drawers. Hanging and again, there was one at the Chipstone, the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee has one that I could, you know, sit with and visit and spend time with and open and close it and think about that, that fabric sack and um, how anthropomorphic it looks. And two, what happens for me here is then, especially with this form and with the writing desk form, um, I also started thinking about the structure of the form itself becoming metaphorical and related to, you know, furniture is human scale because we use it. So it relates to our bodies and we often name parts, the parts of furniture are named after our bodies too because of that. But I started thinking more literally about that metaphor, especially with that crazy work table. I mean, you can't, you can't help but start thinking metaphorically about that. So, the plywood um, work that I started doing, sometimes the plywood work is just to help me quickly get a form generated so that I can work through ideas, okay? And I'm going a little bit out of order chronologically here, but um, so you'll see, I just, you know, quickly brad kneeled together this plywood form and then started playing around with, I had had in my head for a long time, this idea to make one of these sewing tables um, incorporating wedding dresses and having it sort of standing on its dress so that it can't move or anyway. Um, so that's uh, the final version of that piece. And again, opening up the furniture object to allow you to sort of come inside of it, project yourself inside. So I think these, as sculptural forms, they still project function because we still relate them to furniture, even though this isn't functional furniture. But then I also try to manipulate the form to bring you um, inside of it as well. And then these were uh, vintage wedding dresses from around the 30s and 40s that I found on eBay. It was pretty special too. They were both handmade um, to start to see someone else's handiwork, likely a woman and start taking that apart and reconstructing it. And then this was one of the plywood forms that actually became an, a sculptural piece who painted and these were um, found scraps of, uh, not scraps, but found quilted pieces, quilted remnants that had never been made into a quilt. I don't know who made these. They were in my aunt's basement. She claimed they weren't hers, um, but also just thinking about all the labor especially women's labor related to these objects and what they either st uh, stored, facilitated, that kind of thing. Um, and th that one, actually, this train comes out three times further. It's it comes out about 18 feet um, from that. Um, so then a little bit out of order, just because I want to end with this piece, thinking about um, 
a Queen Anne style ladies writing desk. Um, these are some, you sometimes see these advertised like this one in the Christie's auction catalog was referred to as a diminutive, <laughs> which I think is really interesting. They are, they tend to be very small, very petite. They almost feel somewhere scale-wise between real furniture and like doll furniture, child's furniture, maybe. And then, you know, you have this amazing pigeonhole compartment that has all these little cubbies and drawers and stuff like that. And I've always been fascinated with those. Then they, you know, usually this lid folds up. So then there's this secrecy to it. Um, and as a child, I had a desk that was kind of like this with all these cameras. And I used to play with things in there with my dolls or my animals. Anyway, I started thinking about the richness of that interior space, these secret, you know, where furniture is known for having little secret compartments or you pull out, you pull something out and then you access something behind. Um, so this piece, I actually, this was one of the first plywood pieces that I made in grad school. Um, and this was what actually started the whole plywood process and using that. And um, I made this mock-up um, just basswood and, and poplar in the bottom and, and the plywood um, case. This is where I was shooting grad nails of all every which way. <laughs> really just to get the form down. And then my professors were like, what do you mean you're making a hairwood version of this that's going to take you three months or whatever? This is the piece. This is what you're putting in the show. And, and I, again, so this is what started that whole crisis. Um, but so I was like, okay, but then it has to have one of those little drawers has to show that I can hand cut <laughs> dovetails, right? I can't not, so I made this little time capsule. So it actually, again, playing with that, it doesn't even function as a drawer because both the bottom and the top are glued up into a groove, but it does have some pretty sweet little badass um, pins and tails, right? It's beautiful, curly. Anyway, um, they didn't understand. Most people didn't understand, but I did. And scrawled in, so it's time capsule and scroll inside that I almost forgot that that's there in Carpenter's Pencil are quotes from my grandfather about, for him, they were, they were, had a religious context, but quotes about um, living your life in service to your fellow humans. So eventually um, that morphed into, this ended up being my master's thesis show for my MFA. So I had done some, you know, of the Hadley chess using my fine woodworking <laughs> skills and stuff. I put the pear wood aside. I still have the pear wood. Uh, it will eventually turn into a lady's writing desk. Um, but I, again, you can see how I started playing with that form, thinking metaphorically with it, and also thinking about that pigeonhole area as a, a a place of sort of play, imagination, almost like a stage. Um, and so this is what it turned into. And um, again, I can't go into the whole process, but at first I made three of them, that wasn't enough. And then, and then it was like, oh, they're gonna be a circle together. And so I built six, but that wasn't a big enough circle. So <laughs> I ended up doing nine. I like odd numbers better than even numbers. And then someone pointed out to me that not the gestation for human beings is nine months. I don't know if that was in there somewhere subconsciously, um, but it was like, okay, I can kind of make sense. I built the first one and I was just thinking about that interior space and all the different things that that could be. Um, and eventually part of the way I started making sense of that group of objects that I made and what I put into them and what it did with them was thinking about my own. Um, and two, this comes from, you know, after I built the form and I'm sitting here painting it red and, and just like building furniture, um, 
if you do upstairs, you get really intimate with the piece, you know, and at points I'm sticking my head inside of here and everything. And these pieces, one of the way that I started understanding them was they were, they had to do with my own relationship to my childhood. Um, to my own childhood and children's play and also to this kind of um, liminal space of memory and how our identities are formed and how we make sense of our past self as a child and the role that memories play in that and that memories are these sort of is our this sort of suspended space. Um, and I was thinking about ideas related to transcendence and slipping out of one realm to another. Um, but they became a lot for me, this series about, yeah, my relationship to um, my memories as a, as a child and whether, I don't know how accurate a lot of those memories are. I mean, how many how many of you have memories that when you talk to one of your parents, they're like that, <laughs> or not that way, and right? But they're still part of um, our story or our identity. So you see, the one had a little um, hanging figure that when you twirl the knob at the top, it was hinged and it swirls around and little whirling dervishes, right? Which if you know anything about the history of whirling dervishes, yeah. Turkish is a religious sect and they whirl to, to um, for the way I understand it anyway, um, to reach some state of ecstasy. And so again, it was just all this interesting. So then eventually um, when I revisited that, um, for this uh, exhibition I did in 2021 at the Center for Craft in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I had the honor to receive one of the, their inaugural, um, not gonna leave them. Craft, craft funds. Yeah, artist fellowship funds and, um, and then got to do work for an exhibition there. So I thought about those three forms, the Hadley chest, um, the, sew, the Queen Anne writing desk and then the sewing table. And I started um, early on my work was thinking about, I think you can tell from the things that I said early was thinking about um, more the oppression of women in early America the from the patriarchy and stuff. And then I started thinking about these forms more as in, in a more positive light and thinking about, um, almost you know, thinking of them as proto-feminist proto forms that actually facilitated more agency for women. They have locks most and, and, and they either stored or facilitated women's work. So it kind of reshaped the way that I was thinking of that. Um, and so this one is become and I collaborated with a friend of mine, Katie Hudnall, who's a studio furniture maker. She actually teaches at UW Madison now. Um, and her work involves a lot of kinetic components. And I was always fascinated by that. And I can't do, I can't figure that stuff out. Right. So we collaborated on this um, little guy that opens. And a friend of ours, also Maggie Sasso, who trained as a woodworker, but is also a textile artist. One of the things she does is making them be tassels. So I had to do this. And then you all know this too references back to the time, especially during the federal period, when often furniture would have a, a handmade tassel on it and it's um, back and forth between textiles and the furniture work. Um, and then there's another piece that I didn't get to show, but I did make, I did use my fine woodworking skills that I here at North Bennett, and there's a version of the ladies writing desk that is cherry. The case is dovetailed and it's got sort of pigeonhole area. Um, and again, I collaborated with uh, Maggie and commissioned an inkle band that she hand wove. And in the pigeonhole area in the center, there's a little set of steps. And again, that was this thing that I always just wanted to turn 
one of those door openings <laughs> into almost like a dowel house and have steps and it has this band that comes down those steps like a runner and comes off the front and drops almost to the ground, not quite. So it's like this tension created. And I too was that with that was thinking about um again like all the ways that we come out as people. Um and this, you know, this sort of secret storage area, pigeonhole area, then opening up. Do you have any so, questions for VA? I mean, I, sure. I just, I'm so struck by the tension that you acknowledge and have to navigate between being a craftsperson, being an artist, using high craft and high value for like quality materials, using a brad nailer and plywood and um, the, the anxiety of, of that shifting and I guess it's not so much a question, but I just wonder any reflections you might offer. I just regret so much that we've created an environment where it's either or, it's like technique or concept, it's craft or art. And I just, I really appreciate that you over a lifetime of a career have navigated an and situation, a both situation. And anyway, I just, if you have any thoughts about yeah. that, I think that tension is alive and I regret it. And I appreciate that you show us that it can be navigated. Well, thanks for bringing that up, Sarah. Um, you know, here in my presentation, it might seem fairly seamless other than, you know, my crisis about, but, but it wasn't, and it still isn't. I mean, I do, I think like a lot of artists and creative people, I, I, Sometimes I have to convince myself that I'm not a charlatan. <laughs> um, but it is, it, 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 I don't know, it's very exciting. And I also think that um, you, you know what, and I talked about this before, but what's the what's the most exciting to me about the time we live in right now as makers is everything is so open, right? And we have the old way of doing things and the new way and the old way hasn't gone away. It's still here and it's still viable. And the, the fact that North Bennett Street is still here proves that. And I'm really interested in the value of what is learned here in this building in relation to all the digital technology, right? And what's the most exciting to me is the dialogue um, back and forth between those worlds and what can be imagined today that was not imaginable without those two worlds intersecting. I mean, we can go back, you can learn, I, this big art history lecture class I teach, I show these kids this, dub, this amazing dubstep dancer that I love and Marquis Scott. And then I say, you know what is so cool about this? That man is amazingly skilled. Like imagine being able to move your body like that. You know, we wouldn't have thought to move our bodies like that if we hadn't created digital technology that was mimicking human movements, right? There's there's all kinds of stuff in our world that um, was not imaginable before and it can't happen one without the other. And I think the most exciting thing, yeah, is that both and maybe one person doesn't do both but but being open to that it's just like anything though right it's not just a, it's just it's even about culture and whether we value each other or not whether we all feel okay sitting in this room together or going out the door or right it, it it's this stuff is applicable to the bigger, harder questions that we're dealing with as societies and as human beings, I think. And I think craft is an amazing world to navigate that in and think about it in and tell the rest of the world about it with. Sorry. No, it's... you're great. I have a question. <laughs> okay. Um, that I wanted to ask in front of all of these students that are in here. Um, you mentioned, well, your, your in the making program was you in conversation with Mary Savig, a, a, a curator of craft at Smithsonian. And you mentioned um, before this program that you, how much you learned from mm. just being in dialogue with her in preparation for that program. What can you share with this group about the importance of that, the importance of um, 
learning from someone else, you know, nurturing that relationship, um, listening, you know, in, in, in the context of you and Mary. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I teach in a setting where we, we work hard to be diverse and um, promote the importance and value everyone's ideas being valid and 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 learning from each other's ideas um and also i think you know in there are two different i hope this makes sense yeah. and is answering your there i find there are two different ways to approach i'll just use a wood shop as an example and people often either have, they have their own way of doing it and this is the right way, right? And um, egos start clashing and stuff, or it's like, huh, you do that like that? Wow, I didn't think about that before. And that is such a better space um, to be in and learn in and, and learn from each other and I also love that the wood shop is, um, you know, we need each other. My stuff is big. I can't often, once I make it, I can heave one of these around by myself, but not very carefully, right? And I need help, your help getting a sheet of plywood onto that. You know, I need your help with a glue up. Sometimes I need your help joining a big board that's sort of like that kind of stuff. So it, it lends itself to that. But I think in the world of ideas and concepts, it's a, it's a, it's the same way and you know i was fortunate and i know that an art setting is a little bit different because the pride the focus is on the concept and the ideas um but it relate it still relates to everything and you know i i worked hard to develop a sense of community with the people that i was in grad school with and i was a decade old, or at least, and most of my friends there, I turned 40 in grad school. And I remember that scary moment when I painted one of these red and it was sitting in my studio. And I came in the next morning, convinced that I was gonna have to go to Home Depot and have them add, um, what's the complimentary of red green to tone it down, right? So it wasn't so bright. And I came in that morning and there was a note from one of my friends who was a printmaker that, that just said, this is amazing, right? And that was all I needed to stick with that and not be afraid. So I think, you know, making stuff and putting it out into the world is a kind of a scary thing, you know? Yeah, and we help each other. And Mary helped me understand, um, you know, there were things that had been simmering in the back of my mind or things that I was holding on to as references. Um, and I knew they were important and relevant, but it took a mind like Mary's <laughs> then to explain to me, this is why you're focused on um, Carolee Schneemann's controversial feminist piece called interior scroll which you can look up if you don't know it <laughs> and you'll understand thinking about it in relation to the sewing table and that thing coming out between the legs and all that um you know where she said oh, i know why you're thinking why that piece is hovering around in your head right now ba because it's all about this and this and this and your work um is well, I don't have enough time to, you know, talk about the parallel there, but, you know, she was like, your work is embracing a lot of things that women have not been allowed to think about in art, in the art they make, especially in a world like woodworking. Um, and that was, that was incredibly validating, but it also, helped me trust my own ideas more. Um, and I, I said before, like, and my favorite thing to do is put work out in the world and then learn about what I've just done <laughs> by you guys, you know, engaging with it or telling me something that it makes you think about, or um, that's what's the most thrilling to me 
about making art and putting it out there in the world is 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 the connection I get to make with other people around it, people here, but also people from the past, right? I mean, we all share a, an inherited past that's not unproblematic. <laughs> You know, and so what I'm doing is using these objects that are part of that past that I have an affinity with for various reasons, part of because of what I learned here, um, and using those to sort of speak to me and my personal history, but also to a larger history, I hope, um, and be able to engage, you know, and that's just a small little thing I can do, but. Is it was that? Yeah. <laughs> I just love the idea of you and it just that there's mentorship everywhere, you know. And I do not mean that this class is I mean everybody's super close here, everybody listens to each other, but to hear that you and this person, you know, both fans of each other, that there's no superiority here. You can, you know, mentorship is everywhere. Right. You can learn from everywhere. I love that. Well, and one little thing I'll add about that is um Carolee Schneemann, who died not that few years ago, not that long ago, pivotal um, American feminist artist. Um, I got to, I had the pri privilege of hearing her speak in 2011 when I was doing a residency at SUNY Purchase. And she's this amazing woman. She came dancing mm -hmm. out into the, uh, and then as she was talking and she talked about this piece, if you don't know, you don't know it, look it up, interior scroll. And she said, she, this piece came to her and she knew she needed to make it and put it out in the world, but she didn't want to. <laughs> and she was scared. And I, I was like, what? It's okay to be scared, a little bit scared of your own ideas and being vulnerable and putting something out. That's okay. And that's part of being an artist or that was, um, yeah. 